Welcome to Rebuilding the Republic, conversations about America's future here at the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. I'm Mark Hoplick, Assistant Director. We're thrilled to be here with Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, one of America's great poets and president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Among her many achievements, Dr. Alexander was asked by President Obama to deliver the inaugural poem on the date of his first inauguration in 2009. That poem, Praise Song for the Day, delivered a message of hope on that momentous occasion. We'll be discussing Praise Song and other poems, and we're extremely grateful that this conversation will help to conclude our spring 2021 series, Rebuilding the Republic, on a hopeful note. Dr. Alexander is one of our great poets of hope, but her work makes us aware that moments of hope are always moments of apprehension and uncertainty. And more importantly, that moments of hope are always built on histories of shared suffering and the quiet labor of those who toil in obscurity to bring about a better day. Today's conversation is a partnership with Writing and Critical Inquiry and the Department of English. We're pleased to be streaming this directly into the classrooms of Honors Writing and Critical Inquiry taught by Sarah Girigosian and English 350, Contemporary Writers at Work taught by Ed Schwartzchild. And we're very grateful to students for studying these poems and preparing questions. You can read more about Dr. Alexander, her books, and the work of the Mellon Foundation right here on this page. You can also purchase her books via a link to an independent bookstore here on this screen. With us today to lead the conversation is poet Sarah Garagosian, instructor in the Writing and Critical Inquiry Program and Department of English here at UAlbany. Sarah is the author of two poetry collections, Queer Fish, winner of the American Poetry Journal Book Prize and The Death Spiral. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for the introduction, Mark, and thank you for inviting our class into this event. And thank you also to Dr. Schwartzchild. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. I know my class is very excited to be taking part in this event. A number of my students will be writing their final research essays on Dr. Alexander's poems. So I know that they will have uh, many questions to ask. Um, as, as we uh, move into the second segment of our event. But Dr. Alexander, I'm so pleased to meet you. It's, it's really an honor to be in conversation with you. Well, I'm so happy to be here with you today and I'm so happy to be with students. As I said before, some of you came on, I have a pretty bad cold. So I um, am a little bit uh, huskier than usual, but I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, before my um, time at the Mellon Foundation and in philanthropy, I'm a a lifelong college professor. Um, as, so I miss the classroom and I'm just gonna call this the classroom. Uh, I know you all have been Zooming for a long time. So uh, I'm sending you my love and understanding about that. Uh, I have, um, uh, my second son is um, finishing college and the other one, they're a year apart. So um, I do understand. And uh, I think that the thing that is actually um, wonderful about Zoom is that it means at least that um, I can be with you. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask. I'd like to start with um, praise song for the day. Um, so in, in praise song for the day, the speaker characterizes political life and democracy as potentialities. Um, democracy is not an a priori construction, not to be taken for granted, but it seems that it can exist where people gather, speak, and are active makers. As you write, quote, someone is trying to make music somewhere with a pair of wooden spoons on an oil drum with cello, boombox, harmonica voice. And somewhere else, someone is stitching up a hem darning a hole in a uniform, patching a tire, repairing the things in need of repair. Can you say more about your vision of democracy and the power as you understand it of the political poem? 
Um, well, uh, so many things in that in that in that good question. So um, first, I'll just talk about some of the words because it's a poem that doesn't have the word democracy in it. Um, it's a poem that, in its original context, um, it was it came before President Obama gave his um, inaugural address. It happened alongside other artists in other art forms putting music on that stage at that inaugural. So there was Aretha Franklin singing My Country Tis of Thee. There was Yo-Yo Ma on the cello. So there are a lot of different languages that are happening at once. And the poem was made to understand itself in all of those languages. And so what I thought was the musicians themselves uh, you know, I'm, I'm contributing original language to this and maybe the language of poetry is different from, but complementary to the language of politicians. Uh, President Barack Obama is an extraordinarily eloquent politician. He is a person of words. He is a writer who has written beautiful books with his own hands. Um, so he's unusual in that regard. But politics does have its language. And so one of the ways that I think about the absence of the word democracy or many other words in that poem is I think about the presence of the word love in the poem, the importance of the word love in the poem. And um, I haven't um, checked, you know, a computer could probably check this to see um, when Barack Obama has uh, in the course of his public life used the word love. Um, but I wasn't necessarily expecting it to be on that stage. Interestingly, if he were sworn in today, I bet he'd find that word. I, I you know, um, a, a after the years that we've been through. So um, I think the asking in the question, what if the mightiest word is love as a culminating question, as a real question, as a question that's not rhetorical, as a question that can be answered in many different ways seemed to me to be the way that the latitude that the poet has in language, which is kind of infinite, um, would be something that would be additive to that particular moment. Um, you talk about the political poem. Um, and so let's imagine that this is and isn't a political poem. Um, you know, it is okay, a political poem because it happens at a moment that was born by political action. That is to say, people voted, they elected a president. One of the things I was thinking about very, very much um, uh, that ties into your question about democracy is that um, this is a president who was elected uh, by many, many different people in coalition. Uh, you know, more than in American history, more small donations, more people saying this is what we want, more young people, more black and brown people, more of a variety of people came together to say, this is, the, this is the change we seek. This is the hopeful moment. Um, so that political act of the election and then the inaugural, you know, this was the poem for that. Um, but is it a political poem? You know, what is a political poem? Um, my answer to that usually is to break down the root of the word um, political. Um, you know, it is polis, P-O-L-I-S, uh, of, of, of the, the people, the people gathered. And certainly one of the things that I tried to, to think a lot, a lot about um, was uh, about the tremendous multiplicity of the country and of people doing everyday things, everyday people doing everyday things and what that adds up to um, uh, and, and, and what hopefulness that embodies and how you, how you, you think about expressing a we that is so varied. So I think in that regard of the polis, yes, it's a political poem, but um, I also am always wary of the ways that calling something political can often be used as invective. It is often used to describe what women, what people of color, what queer people, what poor people, you know, when they raise their voices to say they want something different, it is often dismissed as being political. I know that's not what you're doing, um, it, but that's why I'm, I'm careful in breaking apart what the word means, because I think um, that all poems uh, that speak of place and people um, are, are, are in their way um, political. 
Yeah, thank you for that answer. That's um, that's really compelling and interesting. And you know, the way you write about love as um, something that hasn't yet resolved itself into a fixed identity, um, as something that can be a resource for for politics, um, I find that to be really compelling. Um, I also, you know, am interested in your your poems, many of which you shared with us. Um, that challenge that seems to challenge an identity politics that embraces monolithic definitions of black identity or fail to be intersectional. Um, can you can you say more about your cultural politics? Um, yeah, I'd like to go back to what you said about love just now, um, because, um, you know, I think about um, Dr. Cornell West, one of his sort of repeated refrains is he says, if you, you cannot serve the people if you do not love the people. So I'm talking about love as something animating, something that's a raison d'etre. Um, the great um, thinker, poet, memoirist, essayist, theorist, you know, brilliant person in Mount Etna for me, June Jordan, the late June Jordan, um, asks the question, where is the love? And she says, sometimes we have to fight against, but if you do not know what you're fighting for, if you do not know what you love, if you do not know what you're saying yes to, if you do not know what you're protecting, if you do not know what you're valuing, then uh, you, know, you will exhaust yourselves with a, a politics of against. Against has to know what it's saying yes to. There has to be a vision. Without vision, the people perish. You know, um, so so that's really how I think about about love in a very very you know fundamental way. And and also in that poem, um, what I say is love beyond marital filial. So I'm saying you know yes, there's rom romantic love, and that's all well and good. Um, uh, in fact, that's. A beautiful thing, <laughs> um, but um, uh, you know the kind of love that is solely about a dyad. I have no use for as a force in society. Okay, love beyond filial, a love that is only about the people who you grew up with, the people who you are technically related to. Again, we have to take care of each other in radiating circles. But as a force, that can be a closed door. So that's why I talk about the idea of queer family in a very, very broad sort of way. What does it mean to define our families beyond you know, the, 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 our immediate partners if we have them, our immediate parents, our immediate siblings? Because we are sunk if that's the only place our love goes, right? So in the poem, love that spreads a widening pool of light um, because love actually is um, a uh, very powerful natural resource. Um, very, very powerful. So it's really sort of squandered and I think um, turned inward if it's only kept within those small units. So that's what I wanted to say about, um, about, about love. What are my cultural politics? Um, I don't even know how to answer that question. Um, you know, uh, I believe in doing away with lies. I believe in lifting up the voices of people whose voices haven't been lifted. Um, I believe that sometimes the things that we call culture, we call culture because they've been over-resourced. And uh, that, you know, sometimes it, that the forms and shapes and sounds that culture make um, makes are, are, are so varied, but sometimes we need to be taught how to listen for different forms because we are used to uh, certain forms. Um, my cultural politics are about, you know, um, uh, rejecting um, exceptionality um, and in thinking that any uh, privilege that anyone has is um, specially deserved. Um, I think uh, we all deserve love and safety and beauty and peace. No one deserves it any more than anybody else. So, you know, a cultural politics that says, if I get to be in this room, if I get to be, uh, you know, making decisions at 
the Mellon Foundation, which I'm really proud to do, that those are always going to be um, about thinking about a greater good, but thinking about a greater good in a way that's very, very, very sharp and discerning. Yeah, thank you for answering that very big question. And um, I, I just, I find your, um, your discussions of love to be very generous and inclusive, um, you know, especially given that they're not premised on state definitions of love, right? Um, as a queer poet, I, I really, um, I feel included by that gesture. So thank you. Um, I think many of us as poets have been thinking about what poetry can accomplish under the various crises of our time. Um, has your thinking or writing changed after these past four years in terms of what it means uh, to be a poet? Um, well, you know, I, 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 these past four years in particular, I've, I've thought a lot about, um, about the violence that language can do. Uh, you know, actual serious violence, real violence, material violence. You know, executive orders can be issued that result in uh, the the death and dehumanization of other human beings. Um, you, know, you know, rhetorics can be created um, uh, that um, are uh, are racist and dehumanizing and result in harm uh, to other human beings, um, which you know we're seeing right now in the uh, tremendous, tremendous rash uh, of um, street violence against Asian Americans um, that is positively tied to the former occupant of the Oval Office using a, a very particular racist language to repeatedly to talk about um, this illness that he did nothing to stop. That he let consume half a million people that he let more than half a million people believe was some kind of, you know, uh, you know, made up thing that he lied to us about. Uh, this can't be said, you know, I'm saying this at the lowest volume of propriety because it's that serious. So when I say like words do violence, words do violence, that is what I mean. And we saw that, but I also believe that words are words are what we are exchanging right now. That is all we got. You know, are the words that we're exchanging with each other. And I believe that in, in those words, just like in those hateful words, I believe his soul traveled in those hateful words. I'm giving you a little piece of my soul and you'll give me a piece of your soul back in those words. You know, can't touch you, can't hug you, um, but we can exchange these words. And poetry, I think of the art forms that use words, I do think is the highest, which is to say, I think that the distillation and precision and music of poetry, you know, like it doesn't work unless you're absolutely distilled and precise. And unless you found some kind of music, there are so many different kinds of music, um, and I think that what we all know is that um, there's a way that music um, enters us, opens us, affects us. You know, there's a physicality to music. And poetry, when we get it right, um, has that power as well. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's just a, a, a superpower <laughs> uh, to be able to make poems um, uh, that hopefully then um, uh, are um, speak to other human beings and other human beings who you may never be able to be in the presence of. I mean, that seems pretty amazing to me. Thank you so much. Um, you set me up perfectly for my next question. Mm. Speaking of music, I think there's no greater practitioner of a musical surprising poetics than Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, and in your collection of essays, The Black Interior, you write, no music was too strange for poetry in the path Gwendolyn Brooks had cleared. From her earliest work, she was clearly committed to honoring the small details of ordinary lives and to seeking the plain beauty and surroundings that others would ignore. 
I see an obvious affinity with your own poetics. Um, to what extent are you writing out of similar concerns as though you, those you see in Brooks's poetics? Um, as you know, Brooks writes for and towards a we, a Black community that is diverse and various and has mixed and perhaps even competing expectations of the Black poet. Well, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks is, is, is my, um, you know, one of several, but she's, she's my poetry mother, you know, she, um, I have learned and continue to learn um, so much from her. Uh, I've edited a, and, and a, a, a collection of her poems and helped make sure that her work stays in the world. Um, you know, I think that her brilliance, I think she is is still underestimated as a great genius. You know, one thing um, it's fun to throw down in English departments is um, is I actually, I do think, you know, like I, I think I assert that she is the finest American poet in the 20th century. Um, you know, we could, we could argue about it, but, um, but I could beat you um, because <laughs> of what Miss Brooks has given us, right? Um, I mean, the singularity of her voice, um, uh, the quirkiness, um, uh, the trust that she has, the way that she doesn't sound, I mean, you know, two words in and her poems are, are recognizable. But also you talked about writing to the we, and um, I think that um, her profound humanity um, her profound humanity. You know, I I, I was thinking um, with all of um, of the police killings and po particularly the police killings of of, of young uh, people. Um, of her um, poem, I, I'm just looking for it here. It's called um, "The Boy Died in My Alley," and uh, without 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 my having known, um, apparently died alone. I'm gonna find it and read you just. Uh, a couple lines. Um, and I think also, if you think about her late book, Children Coming Home, um, and just her sense that our children, and this goes back to my idea about family, belong to all of us. They have to. They have to. So, you know, there are the ones uh, uh, that you know, you are responsible for. <laughs> um, but then at the next level, what does it mean to be responsible as older people and as a society for our young people in a very profound way? There are a lot of different ways to answer that. Um, and so just a, a, a little bit of the poem, uh, and it's called, um, The Boy Died in My Alley to Running Boy. The boy died in my alley without my having known, policeman said next morning, apparently died alone. You heard a shot, policeman said, shots I hear and shots I hear, I never see the dead. The shot that killed him, yes, I heard, as I heard the thousand shots before, careening tinnily down the nights across my years and arteries. Policeman pounded at my door. Who is it? Police, policeman yelled. A boy was dying in your alley. A boy is dead and in your alley. And have you known this boy before? I have known this boy before. I have known this boy before who ornaments my alley. I never saw his face at all. I never saw his future fall, but I have known this boy. I have always heard him deal with death. I have always heard the shout, the volley. I have closed my heart ears late and early, and I have killed him ever. I joined the wild and killed him with knowledgeable unknowing. I saw where he was going. I saw him crossed and seeing. I did not take him down. He cried not only father, but mother, sister, brother. The cry climbed up the alley. It went up to the wind. It hung upon the heaven for a long stretch strain of moment. The red floor of my alley is a special speech to me. So that's Gwendolyn Brooks, the boy died in my, my alley. And you know what I think is so interesting about her for those of you, you who are writing poems, um, she was born in Topeka, Kansas, moved soon after after to Chicago, to the South Side. 
And in her entire life, she lived, I think, to 83. Um, she, once she got to Chicago, she never moved outside of like maybe a 10 block radius. And she always said, all I have to do is look out the window and there's a poem. She was of her community and felt that um, her community was an infinite human resource um, and that she was charged with singing the many, many different songs of her community. Um, and um, I've lived a lot of different places, but I think um, that idea is really, really, really powerful. And I admire that in her so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, the admiration is mutual. And um, thank you for that poignant reading. I, I think it really demonstrates just how timeless Brooks is. Um, I'm, I'm getting some questions in chat right now from my students. So um, keeping an eye on time, maybe this is a good, a good time to segue into student questions. Um, Elise, would you like to ask Dr. Alexander your, your question? Yes. Um, hi, Dr. Alexander. Hi. Uh, your poems cover a variety of genres, such as like race, gender, history, and even motherhood. So in your poem, Prize Song for the Day, I'd like to know what you meant when you stated, we encounter each other in words, words spiny or smooth, whispered or declaimed words to consider, reconsider. We cross dirt roads and highways that mark the will of someone and then others who said, I need to see what's on the other side. Thank you for that question, Elise. There are a couple pieces to it. Um, we talked earlier about um, we encounter each other in words uh, and about the idea of, you know, the sort of human exchange in the form of words. Um, but then to the part that you read out, words spiny or smooth, um, uh, whispered or declaimed, um, I think that that's where I'm really in um, a poet's delight of the textures of words and all the different things that words can be. When, when you're writing poems, I think to imagine uh, and to know that the entire language and not just the English language, language is yours, sound is yours, it is all there. And I think it's really important to have a sense of the sound, the texture uh, of how, you know, the word prickle is different from the word bloom, you know, um, um, uh, just that real absolute like deep dive reveling in all the possibilities of words um, is, is how we, we, we make something um, out of them. Um, and then I think to the part that you concluded with, <coughs> excuse me, um, in writing this poem, um, I was thinking about, oh my good, goodness, you know, Barack Obama has asked me to write a poem for his inaugural. This has to be like, this is an American poem. This is a big old country. Um, and I know that I can't capture it all. I can't distill it all. But I did think a lot about poets like Walt Whitman and Walt Whitman's really long inclusive line and his long lists that said like, you know, uh, um, America as an idea is an inclusive idea. And as I thought about that, like literally almost, you know, in a mind exercise of scanning across the land, right? Um, and what would it mean to write a poem that scanned the land that was not about um, dominion, um, you know, that was not about conquest, um, but was rather about, uh, as I said earlier, everyday people. Um, I did think so much um, about the people who I admire so much, who took risks uh, and worked so hard, um, perhaps to get here, perhaps to stay here, perhaps to make their way, make their um, lives uh, driven by, I need to see what's on the other side. And sometimes what's on the other side is not like the Emerald City, um, uh, but that spirit, that will against so many odds in so many different stories um, was definitely something I was thinking about. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you. I see another question in chat. Um, Anisha, would you like to ask your question? 
Sure. My question was just when you were presenting the poem to the president and the crowd, how did it feel? Like, what was the emotions you were experiencing during that time? When I was reading out the poem? Yeah. 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 That's the question, isn't it? Um, it was, um, um, it was a, the, the moment itself was a beautiful moment. You know, one way I always feel about poetry readings actually is once they're happening, um, I, I'm often nervous beforehand, but once they're happening, I look at the paper and I say, well, girl, you wrote it, you know, so just read it. Um, you know, the, the hard thing is writing the thing. Um, so I remember also that the poem is bigger than I am. You know, the, the, the poem is, it's a, a, a living thing. And so at this point, I'm not at the point, I'm a servant of the poem. And <clears throat> so that was certainly something I was thinking. I was thinking about um, what, it was extraordinary just in the kind of like, wow, department to look out at, at a crowd as far as the eye could see and beyond, to see that many people gathered peacefully in a hopeful, beautiful moment was something that I love to describe and will never forget because such moments are true and real. Um, I felt um, a big responsibility because I knew that I was there as a representative of American poetry and American poets living and dead. So I had a very much of a sense of, you know, being on the stage with many, many, many people on the stage with me, that this was a moment for American poetry hundreds of people could have done it beautifully. So I was representing like my people in that regard. Um, and then I, oop, something just, oh no, I'm still here. Sorry, it was something happened on my computer. Um, and also um, um, I felt um, uh, the emotion, I, I sat with my father on stage and uh, he was very active uh, in civil rights uh, he had taken me to the same mall with my mother as a little baby to the March on Washington. And he wore his button from the March on Washington. And so I was thinking, you know, here I was, a, you know, a black woman uh, standing at the inaugural of the first black president on the steps of the Capitol built by black enslaved labor. Uh, and, you know, we are in some way, two steps forward, one step back, that is what history is, but that um, this is a, a moment of moving forward. Um, and so that just felt, uh, that felt uh, pretty awesome. And as you've probably read, it was, I was as cold as I have ever been in my entire life. It was the coldest ever. And we had been on that stage for hours because you have to like, I mean, he didn't have to be on the stage, but you know, everybody else had to be on the stage staged. So um, I also literally could, could not move my face and was just like, you know, trying to figure out how to say a poem from a frozen face um, and do so gracefully. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Camilla, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Um, my question was, um, how do you go about the process of writing poems? And are you very particular with the word choice that you use since you've talked about the power of words before? The word choice is everything. Like the word cho choice is the job. That's what you are there to do is choose the words that, you know, and it doesn't mean always like million dollar words, you know? I mean, you know, sometimes the absolute best word is the simplest word. Um, sometimes if you have more than one uh, language um, in your languages, sometimes the exact right word is, is not an English word, it's, it's another word. When I used to teach more, it was um, really fun to do a writing exercise where I would um, ask everyone to um, write a poem um, in the language of their parents and of their grandparents, of a parent, of a grandparent, um, because um, you know English is gone pretty quickly, <laughs> you know, in a in a whole classroom. I mean, sometimes it's there for a long time, but lots of other things come in, and it's it's really really exciting exciting to see. Um, so it, it it is that. 
listening and, you know, that um, trying to keep track of things. Um, I've always, you know, like, no, no poet, po poets need a job, you know, so I've always had another job. Um, uh, and so sometimes it's keeping track of things on the slip of paper and the little notebook, you know, driving the carpool, doing the whatever the thing is, and then finding time later to look at all the scraps and see, okay, what, what sparks? What do I think I can build on? And um, of course, as you all probably already know, um, you know, a, a lot of it feels bad because it's hard to write well. Um, so, you know, sometimes you have to just power through um, and know that, you know, like untangling a tangled necklace, if you imagine like that frustration, a thin chain, it's just like in one of those knots, you know, patiently, 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 without recrimination, you know, but like bottom in the seat, you keep moving through. So that's some of what it's like. Thank you. I love that metaphor. Thank you. Um, Irma, you have a question. Hi, Dr. Alexander. It's, it's like an honor, like just to be here. So I'm like really excited right now. Um, <laughs> um, one of um, my personally favorite um, poets is Audre Lorde. And from one of yes. her pros, um, she's able to say, it is learning how to stand alone, unpopular and sometimes reviled and how to make common causes with those other identified as outside the structures in order to define and seek a world in which we can all flourish. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths. When you're speaking about the concept of love and how important it is to have it now, especially with such hateful things in the news and especially with all, of course, the, the continuous uh, police brutality and the continuous killings of, young individuals of color. How do you feel that that line from Audre Lorde, you know, making our differences one is so important in today's politics because you're able to say in, you know, today's news in that poem, how Muhammad Ali was, you know, threw out his Olympic gold and saying until black people are truly free in this country, I don't wanna be honored by America. So how important do you feel that those things are then now today? Mm, well, you're my you're my audience plant because uh, <laughs> Audre Lorde is is one of my most important writers too. I wrote about her in my dissertation, and she's um, she's a, a a tremendous tremendous guide and a very powerful philosopher. Um, uh, you know, I, I would love to see more talking about her as you know a, a great American philosopher um, because that idea of strength within difference. Uh, you know, that idea of naming yourself, um, you have to name yourself because others will not name you kindly if you do not, you know, so that's when she says, you know, I am, uh, I am, I am woman, mother, teacher, you know, uh, Karyaku woman, New Yorker, uh, I think she didn't use the word queer, I think she used the word lesbian. Yeah, black black lesbian warrior. Black yeah. lesbian warrior. Thank you. You know, so she's all all of those things. So if I don't put it all down, it's not all gonna gonna be there. Um, how empowering that is! All the journey woman pieces of myself. Um, and so I think that you know a way that that's very powerfully translatable for all of us is, what does it mean to come? full and whole into any room you go into? What does it really mean to bring yourself? Because not everyone's going to put out a marching band, you know, and, you know, saying we're so happy that all the journey woman pieces of you are here. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that all the journey woman pieces of yourself are not exactly what's needed in that space. Um, and I bring Audre Lorde in a way together with something uh, that my father always still says to me. Um, and actually they're both, you know, Harlemites born, I think the same year. Uh, I think Audre Lorde is also 1933, I'm not sure. Um, uh, but um, he would say always, always, he wouldn't say always bring your whole self, um, but he would say always speak your full truth. You may not know that someone's listening, 
the room may be silent. They may throw eggs at you, but someone in that room needs to hear your words and needs to see you full and complete, you know? And there's no other way to be because, I mean, again, you know, we're in um, Audre Lorde line, you know, will your silence protect you? No, it doesn't. Sometimes people go protected by their silence for a little while, but it doesn't protect you forever. So, you know, living in that, you know, burst of light to name her last collection um, is a very powerful and empowering thing to others. Creates wholeness within ourselves, but I think that it also um, uh, invites um, wholeness and solidity in, in, uh, in others. Thanks for bringing her into the thank conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. What a great question and response. Um, let's see, I'm seeing Emma's hand. Um, hi, Dr. Alexander, very, very honored to be speaking with you today. Um, in English 350, we've had the opportunity to, uh, opportunity to talk to a lot of short fiction writers. So I'm really excited that we finally get to speak with a poet. And um, as a fellow poet, I was just wondering how do you kind of push through writer's block when you get it? I think uh, I have an issue where if, if it doesn't sound right, as soon as it's coming out of the pen onto the paper, I like have this feeling that I want to quit. So how do you kind of push through that? Yeah, well, um, there's, you know, there's a, a sort of tender part of the answer and a tough part of the answer. Um, the tender part of the answer um, is that writing is, is, it's brave to tell the truth in writing. You know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard because you're doing a courageous thing to find the right words to tell a deep truth. And by that, I, you know, mean, of course, you know, there's the truth of like, you know, my sweater is black, but we're talking about the profound truths that poetry can get us to, right? That is not easy. Um, you know, listening to when, you know, you can hear yourself when you're not fully there, but continuing to push that courage at, at, at looking at and, 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 and the, the writing that is just like not yet beautiful. Um, it doesn't feel good, um, but I think it's very important not to coddle yourself, but at the same time to just really, you know, imagine, um, you know, I imagine that that, you know, person who stands on my shoulder, you know, the hateful, horrible, like demonic, you know, little person who looks just like me, but is small, you know, I, I do sometimes say like, I'm bigger than you and I pick her up and I throw her away. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes you just gotta, you know, just keep, uh, don't imagine, you know, don't distract me. Um, the tough part, I think, is that not everybody is an artist. Now, creative expression is available to everyone, every single human being. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that you see when you spend time around children is you know the way they put things and say things i mean but you know before they've been too socialized is so very creative the way they move um you know everything about them, <laughs> the way they dress themselves if given the opportunity <laughs> um, um so creative expression is good for everybody but actually becoming a a an artist staying the course is not for everybody. And so, uh, you know, I, I um, talk sometimes about, I, I was a very, very serious dancer when I was younger. And I thought that was what I wanted to do. And I was pretty good at it. I wasn't good enough at it to make a life in it. And so I think that there was, and that it was very painful, but what it meant was that I found the thing um, that I, I, I could practice and get better at, and that was where I was meant to be. Um, so I think that that's a piece of the hardness too. Thank you. You're very welcome. It's not meant to be discouraging. Mm. Yep. Um, I'm seeing a question from John in the chat. John, would you like to ask your question? 
Um, first off, I, nice to meet you. And um, I'm in the same position with uh, my music. I'm decent enough at it, but I'm not at a point where I can make any sort of living off it. That's why I'm here in college. But I want to know with any form of uh, artwork, or in your case, poetry, do you ever come to a point where you're completely satisfied with the final project? You know, that's um, such a good, and what I should also just add on, your, your comment made me think about it, is that that doesn't mean, like, I'm not gonna actually dance right now, but like, I dance every day. I mean, the joy of the art that we love, even if we're not up on a stage doing it, is something that we should always remember that nobody can take that from us. Um, there, there are a, a lot of um, interesting things that have been said about finishing. You know, some uh, painter, I don't remember, you know, and poet, you know, someone said like homes are never finished, they're only abandoned. And someone said, my painting is done when it's time to go to dinner, you know? And what I think is interestingly in all of that is that there comes a point where sometimes stopping actually can be a great teacher. So what, what I find is that, you know, I, I take it as far as I can go and mind you, you know, this is like rigorous sweaty work. And then if I know that it may not be done but I can't do any more, then I put it in a folder, I put the folder in the drawer and then I may revisit it the next morning. And sometimes it seems like as though by magic, like, ah, oh, you know, all I had to do was lop off that last line, you know, or, oh, actually this is a much longer poem or, you know what, this poem actually will never be so good. I need to go on and write the next poem. But saying I was finished has cleared the way for me to do the new thing. Sometimes I look back at things years later that I didn't know how to finish. And I see like, oh, okay, now I understand. So I do think that um, knowing when to push through is important, but also knowing when to let be um, is, is a really good teacher as well. Thank you. Yes, I struggle with perfectionism myself. So great advice. Yep. Um, Deborah. Um, hi, uh, Dr. Alexander. Um, so my first question is, um, what advice would you give someone pursuing a degree in Africana studies or any other major like that and considering possible life paths for um, adding to the movement for equality? Like what advice would you give someone like that? Because I see people like you and like um, Maya Angelou and James Baldwin who like take poetry and writing or even like Toni Morrison. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily consider myself to be an artist. So I'm, I want to know like what advice would you give me to like consider future like things for me to consider to add to this movement. And also um, as somebody at, that preaches for like, um, like a all unconditional love for everybody and inclusivity, what advice would you give us as the next generation to take those steps so that we could move forward um, to adopt those sort of principles in our lives to um, create a better future, not only for ourselves, but for future generations past ours. Wow, thank you. A lot of questions in there. Um, and I'll start with the easiest tweak. Um, I actually don't believe in unconditional love. Um, I believe in unconditional love for your people, people, right? You know, um, but I don't believe in universal unconditional love. I believe in the power and force and uh, animating energy of love as um, understanding it, you know, again, beyond the romantic, beyond the family, um, to thinking about what is my love for people, for community, for society, for the future, etc. Um, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled you asked me about Africana studies. Um, for many years, I chaired the African American Studies Department at Yale University. African American studies is my field. Um, and I think there could be no better major um, because um, I think that um, intersectional majors, interdisciplinary majors, t uh, give you incredible critical thinking skills. Uh, so that if you are studying a poem and you want to understand the history of when it was, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks' poem, Southside Chicago, she was born in this particular time. The Great Migration meant that six million people came from the Black South because of, you know, terror and moved to cities like Chicago. 
you know, what was the context in which she made this poem? What were the social movements? What was the impact of this poem? Um, you know, uh, you know, how did she make a living? You know, you're bringing in economics, sociology, political science, history, literature. Um, you know, what would she have on her radio? What sounds would she have been hearing? Right. So the ability to surround any question or topic or object that way is fantastically powerful. And it is a real skill in almost any job you could have. Um, it, you know, it gives you thinking skills, it gives you writing skills. And quite frankly, I mean, you know, it, it, it gives you a way of understanding this country we live in and its history in a way that doesn't just take at face value one version of the narrative. That's a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous tool. If you go into justice work, um, you need to know that history. You know, you need to be armed with the power of that history. You need to be armed with the power of the examples of tremendous, tremendous people who were so courageous and so strategic uh, in order to get things done and think about what that means for what you're doing in the present. So, you know, when I was um, chairing the department, I parents um, of, of kids of all races would sometimes call me. I loved when the parents called um, because then I get to talk about to them about their wonderful kids. And usually that was like the whole point. But they'd say sometimes, you know, but I'm scared. What's what's Susie going to do with this major? You know, and I could give an answer like the one I gave you. Um, uh, and talk about all of the ways and all the directions you can do it. And in fact, how handicapped you are um, if you don't have a critical understanding um, of the richness and struggle um, that is in this history that belongs to all of us. Um, did I miss one piece of your question? Was there a piece I left out? Um, yeah, how would you basically tell us like as the future generation to take steps to um basically build towards a better future for everybody. Beautiful, yeah. Okay, thank you for, um, for reprising that. Um, I would say that, you know, change and positivity moves in concentric circles. So even as you're thinking about how to solve very, very large problems, you need to remember that where you start, uh, you know, you don't have to go off your campus to find issues that you need to deal with, change that needs to be made. Um, you know, outside of your family, there are, you know, one of the, I, I mentioned my own um, uh, beloved kids who are um, 23 and, and 21 now. And uh, when they were little, um, one of the, um, you know, with other feminist friends, we would say like, we taught them to question authority. <laughs> and it started with us. <laughs> um, but I think that the real values, you know, that say like, you know, be respectful, be loving, you know, I am a black mommy after all. Um, but, you know, always raise your voice with questions. Um, always try to understand what are the ethics of your family? That which you call family. How are you on your block? You know, I think that that all of that moves out um, to understanding how you are with every act you do is a way that leads you towards making the world a better place and also finding where you can be most useful. I would say also, um, you know, that um, there's a lot that's um, very fearful it's very frightening um, right now. There's a lot of violence. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not an easy time. Um, and I think that, you know, throughout this pandemic, um, I mean, again, I'm, I'm grateful for Zoom because with this cold, I would have stayed home um, if uh, I wouldn't, well, wouldn't want to bring it into the room with you. So now we can be together. But um, I think that, you know, human beings need to congregate human beings need to congregate. And so um, as we emerge from this hard period that we've been through, um, I think it's um, important to remember that we must always, no matter who we are, no matter where we stand, no matter what our privilege is, 
we must always remember to bring others into the room with us. You know, always remember to be generous, always remember to be a listener, um, even as you raise, as you raise your voice. Uh, and always remember that, you know, speaking those uncomfortable truths, you know, back to, to Audre Lorde, um, you know, I think, well, you know, who am I to sit on my voice when I see something wrong? Let's talk about Darnella Frazier. Darnella Frazier, 17 years old, for almost 10 minutes filming the police murder of George Floyd. And that girl on the stand said she wished she physically could have stopped it. She felt she hadn't done enough. And she did such a brave thing. She did such a brave thing. So, um, you know, I, 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 I wish for us not to have to be in, in situations so dire, but you will, I hope you all act on your courage. It's, it's really important. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for that deep question. Thank you for that beautiful response, Dr. Alexander. Um, I, I wanna be respectful of your time. And um, I know that many of us would like to hear you read praise song for the, de um, for the day, if you would be willing. Let's try. We're gonna try um, with this throat. We are gonna try. And thank you all for studying my poems. I deeply appreciate it. <laughs> Praise song for the day, a poem for Barack Obama's presidential inauguration. Each day we go about our business, walking past each other, catching each other's eyes or not, about to speak or speaking. All about us is noise. All about us is noise and bramble, thorn and din, each one of our ancestors on our tongues. Someone is stitching up a hem, darning a hole in a uniform, patching a tire, repairing the things in need of repair. Someone is trying to make music somewhere with a pair of wooden spoons on an oil drum with cello, boombox, harmonica, voice. A woman and her son wait for the bus. A farmer considers the changing sky. A teacher says, take out your pencils, begin. We encounter each other in words, words spiny or smooth, whispered or declaimed, words to consider, reconsider. We cross dirt roads and highways that mark the will of someone and then others who said, I need to see what's on the other side. I know there's something better down the road. We need to find a place where we are safe. We walk into that which we cannot yet see. Say it plain that many have died for this day. Sing the names of the dead who brought us here, who laid the train tracks, raised the bridges, picked the cotton and the lettuce, built brick by brick the glittering edifices they would then keep clean and work inside of. Praise song for struggle, praise song for the day. Praise song for every hand lettered sign, the figuring it out at kitchen tables. Some live by love thy neighbor as thyself. Others by first do no harm or take no more than you need. What if the mightiest word was love? Love beyond marital, filial, national. Love that casts a widening pool of light. Love with no need to preempt grievance. In today's sharp sparkle, this winter air, anything can be made, any sentence begun. On the brink, on the brim, on the cusp, praise song for walking forward in that light.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Made it through that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That I um, it's been an honor meeting you. Um, I know that my students feel the same way. This has been a wonderful event. Thank you. Well, it's been really wonderful for me too. Um, is there um before you know you all are a precious uh community for me too. Is there um anything you want to leave me with to think about um that's important to you um before we go, um, I invite you to, sh to shout it out if there's anything um, that you wanted to, to leave us with. I'm looking at the chat too. Anyone? Well, besides that you're awesome and we love you and everything like that, <laughs> um, but I saw that the person who actually was able to read their poem at Biden's, um, mm -hmm. but she just put out a book. Is there is there a possibility of a poem of books? Because I know I'm I'm right there, <laughs> right there. Like especially with everything that's now happening, because like there's like a whole new realm of inspiration. So do you think that that will be in the cards for you in the future to write another book of poems? Thank you for asking that, um, <clears throat> because. <laughs> I do um, a lot of um, my job takes a lot of time and um, I haven't been writing a lot of poetry lately, but I am writing a um, book that is um, an expansion of um, an essay that I wrote last summer called the Trayvon Generation. Um, because I ha was have been thinking about your generation, which is the generation of my children. Um, and, uh, you know, all the uh, violence uh, that you are witnessing, but all of the life force that you're bringing back to it. So um, I am trying to finish that book. Yeah. So it's coming. First announcement right here. Okay. You see, you already got me excited. <laughs> Good. Thank you all so much. We've been speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, poet and president of the Mellon Foundation. What a pleasure and an honor it is to have her speak with our students. Her books are available for purchase from an indie bookstore via link on this screen. Thanks so much, Dr. Alexander and Sarah Garagosian. A big thank you to all of our students. Let me remind you that this and all our author interviews are posted on the Writers Institute's YouTube channel and you can find them at the conversation on our website, newyorkstatewritersinstitute.org. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. To our audience, thanks so much for tuning in. Be well.